Okay, so in this section, we're actually going to get to use R and make your very first model. So get excited. Right now we're going to work on path models. This is the Bojan chapter two and really just focus on starting with models that are all squares so that you can learn some of the basic procedures for Levon. And then in the next video, I have another example of this, but uh, also fit indices and working with how do I interpret the output from Levon. So we're going to kind of try to ease into this. All right. Uh, so just a reminder about diagrams. So circles are latent or unobserved variables. We're going to leave those out right now. Squares are manifest or observed variables. And then something new in this chapter is triangles. Often people use triangles in their diagram to represent an intercept. It is part of a, of a, a square or circle, um, but those are specifically have to be turned on. So generally you don't estimate intercepts, uh, except on specific model types, such as multi-group models or latent growth or latent curve models. And when we get to those, we'll talk about how you do them and what they mean in the output. So right now we're going to leave those out. So really we're going to work with squares today. Um, and just a reminder about what all of the arrows mean, because we're actually going to make a picture. The um, straight single headed arrows are causal. They predict the direction. So in a non-standardized solution, those are our B values, or our slope. So this is like a regression coefficient. In our standardized solution, these are your beta values. So that's a standardized z-score of the solution. A curved or uh, double-headed arrow, so non-directional, is uh, in the non-standardized solution is covariance. And I said last time we talked about this that those are hard to interpret because they're in the scale of the data. Uh, a standardized solution has it be correlation. So people tend to prefer standardized solutions because those variables are standardized. But a quick reminder, all of your endogenous variables, those are Y, so an arrow is coming into them, have an error term. Okay. When you see these error terms, what's going to happen is the error is going to be a little bubble, and the error is actually predicting into the variable. So they end up with two arrows coming into them. Okay. Now in the path diagram we're going to use, it doesn't show you the errors. Um, it will show you the variances, but I don't think it shows you the errors. So you just have to remember that those are there. But why does the error term have an arrow going from the latent to that variable? Okay. Because the error in the model is not explained by any other variable, otherwise it wouldn't be error. And so really, it's not even that the error is predicting the square, it's just that the error is associated with the square. Um, because the square is where the error is coming from. Um, so they're both predicting, all of the, both of the arrows go in towards the square when you're drawing them. Um, uh, we had an example in the chapter one, or chapter one, uh, first lecture about sim terminology. If you go back and you look at them, um, all of the uh, endogenous variables have error terms where the error bubble, uh, the, what's the arrow is going into the square. Let me just show you. I feel like I'm being clear as mud at the moment. All right, so let's look at a picture here. Right, so all of these are endogenous, and if we end up with one where we've included the errors, you'll see that the arrow goes from the error bubble into the square. That is normal. What that means is that um, this square is what's causing the error. So error is caused by the square. Okay. <clears throat> all right, back to this. You don't have to actually really be too concerned with it, because Levon does it for you. Woohoo! Okay. So why should we use a standardized solution? Um, and one thing I like about that is it allows me to pair, compare path coefficients. So if we're particularly interested in um, which variable is the best predictor, a standardized solution is always better. And I'll talk about this in my regular class in regression about why beta. Um, we like beta because it allows me to compare apples to oranges. Um, where I could compare age and income to see which one's a better predictor, even though they're not on the same scale. Okay. It makes all the non-directional relationships correlations, so those double-headed arrows, that's just much more interpretable than covariance. 
um, because anything closer to the absolute value of one is better. And it also, if you're doing a CFA or confirmatory factor analysis, it makes the interpretation very similar. So it matches those values. Your unstandardized solution may go over one. It may be the path coefficient may be 1.7, but in an EFA, you would never see that. So if you're looking at the standardized solution, you can use that same rule that you're used to, like 0.3, anything over 0.3 is good. Why would I use an unstandardized solution? So get both sides here. Um, the good thing about an unstandardized solution is it allows me to um, interpret the coefficient in the original scale of the data. And that's really its good, one good point is that I could say for every one unit increase in this variable, I get B path increases in this other variable. Um, and so that's just like a regular regression. The unstandardized solution is good for interpretation and prediction of future events. The standardized solution is more interpretable uh, and more comparable. Whoop, whoop, I got excited. All right, so what we're gonna do now, and I'm gonna kind of switch screens back and forth here between PowerPoint and R Studio, is install Levon. So it, it stands for Latent Variable Analysis, and that is the book we're using. And it's pretty much one of the only sim estimators. Um, it's not the only one, but it's one of the only ones. So I'm gonna kind of do this, kind of come over here. So we're gonna have our studio here, and this is the um, evals code that is included on Blackboard or on my website, if you're looking at the website. And what you wanna do is first install Levon. So make sure you have that installed. Um, you can click on packages over here in our studio and click on install, and then just start typing it. You do have to be on the internet for this to work. Um, so there's Levon, click install, let it do its thing. Mine's not really gonna do a whole lot because it's already installed. Okay. Great. Um, and then the other thing you'll always wanna make sure you do is open the library for Levon. Okay. So that's what we're gonna use to uh, code this semester, uh, pretty much for everything except item response theory. Now the way the syntax works for Levon is you first have to, let's skip a slide, did I? Okay, good. You first have to build the model. I always, always recommend drawing these first. Just sketch them out on a piece of paper so that you can understand what you're building. But then, on the flip side, I always suggest make, um, make the program diagram the model for you and make sure your diagram you were going for matches what you got. Because sometimes degrees of freedom won't match and you won't know why. Okay. So we're gonna do model equals and then model stuff in quotes. You can do single or double. Okay. You can use a equal sign or the um, this sort of equals. I always just use regular equals. I know there's lots of schmack, coding, blah, about using this particular set, that's way too many key presses for me. So I just use a regular equals, either one. Okay. But what the model stuff part is depends on the picture we're trying to make. Okay. So what does that mean? Uh, let me make this bigger since that's a lot of words. Okay. What does Levon do for me? Why do I want to like it? Um, one thing for me, having written programs in EQS, Lizeral, M+, and Amos now, um, I think maybe I'm only missing one <laughs> of the large programs. Um, the reason I really love this is that it automatically adds those error terms for me. I don't have to remember to do it myself or later go back and go, why the hell is this not identified? Okay. It also automatically does path constraints for you. Um, and so it will assume that you want to identify and scale based on um, a path. You can switch it so it's identifying in a different way. We'll get to that more later. Um, but it does automatically do that for you so that you can't screw that up. Now, the fully structural part you can screw up, but it helps by giving you a hint that you've done something wrong. Okay. It automatically adds a covariance term between all of your exogenous variables. That's really great in CFA. Path models, maybe not so great, but we can talk about how to turn that off. Okay. So it will um, 
force you to include that constraint, but you can always make that constraint a zero, which means go away, leave it off. So I love that automatic piece about Levon. So we're going to start by, this is a picture from the book, but I'm going to apply a more, a different example to it. Um, so be sure you have the evals data set downloaded. Okay. And we're going to create this picture. So it helps if we start with a picture here. Um, and we're trying to build this picture and then look at what the output is. So in thinking about this before we go anywhere else, what is happening? I have two correlated manifest variables. So these are measured variables. And they're correlated because I have a double-headed arrow here. They are exogenous because there are no arrows coming into them. This correlation doesn't count. Okay. And they are predicting this C variable, and then A is also predicting D. Okay. C here is an endogenous variable when considering these, okay. which is why it has an error term out here. And so this double-headed arrow out here represents variance. You will see that on the, um, the pictures we're about to make. But you won't see this variable, so JK, you're not actually going to see that. Um, but this one has a variance out here, so this is a, an error term for C, hence the label EC. Uh, and it does get a 1 on this path. What does that mean? This path is constrained. So when we add the error variances, one thing that happens is that you just want to estimate variance. You don't want to estimate variance and the, the like variance predicting the, the manifest variable, that doesn't make just a whole lot of sense. So instead, what happens is that the error term, I'm pointing like you can see me pointing, um, the error term here gets a constrained path. So it's only estimating one thing, the variance, instead of two, the variance and the path. Okay. If that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, that's okay. Um, when you think about it, remember that any endogenous variable has to estimate the error variance for it, right? The error. Remember, exogenous variables get variance estimated for them. We got the error here. And um, this is this little one here is a way that we control it estimating only one thing instead of two. Alright, now C is an interesting case because it is endogenous from A to B, but it's exogenous from C to D. So it's all, it's both. And so it is predicting D as well. And since D is always endogenous, it also has an error, right? And so here's our one, and we're only estimating the variance for D. And so let's try estimating um, degrees of freedom and making a list of what we expect to get calculated. So that's the example, let's back up. Okay. So what's gonna get calculated here? Well, um, starting with the paths, that's the easiest thing. So one, two, three, four, four regression coefficients, right? And then um, you're gonna get, oh, uh, sorry, random text message, lost my train of thought. Here we go, four regression coefficients, one, two, three, four. And then we're also gonna get two error terms, one, two, so we're up to six covariance between the two, that's seven. And then what are we forgetting? We'll also have variance for these two, so we should have nine total. Okay. I'm sure I've forgotten something. I'm not the best at this, um, but we'll try it and see what happens. Okay. All right, so we should have four, sorry, four path coefficients, two error variances, covariance, and some variances. So we should have about nine things. Okay. The thing I always forget is these, uh, you always have to have a variance for your exogenous terms, because okay. it's hard to calculate covariance without the variance. So to put a real application on this, what I've done is I've taken our um, evaluations from the uh, end of year terms for our school, and I have um, question 12, which is a course, this is a course I wanted to take, which always predicts people's ratings. If they like your course, they rate your course higher. Um, if you teach statistics, that always counts against you because they don't want to take stats. All right. Um, Question two, which is I'm, uh, is the course is clear and organized. Question four, which is that the grading is fair for the course. And then we're gonna try and predict their overall evaluation. So what's really happening is I'm trying to create a picture where I'm looking at a course I wanted to take, predicting their overall scores, but it also predicts whether or not I think the grading is fair. 
Um, what was B again? Sorry, I've already forgotten. Clear and organized. So if I want to take the course and I think it's clear and organized, I probably may or may not think the grading is fair, but definitely fair grading and course I wanted to take predict our overall evaluation. So we're going to try to create this picture with that data. All right, did that with this. So the way to create pictures is to um, build a model. Now, I did a little bit of extra work here when I built this model, but let me back up and let's look at the picture and talk about it. First thing we need to do is create C here. And what C is, is C is, is predicted by, so C is Y, A and B. And if you're used to writing code from, a, from LM, from the linear modeling uh, perspective and from uh, working with, um, you know, uh, Nova syntax or um, uh, ANCOVA syntax, you're used to this, this, the way this is done. If you're switching from SPSS or, or Amos, this is just gonna be different for you. And so what you wanna do is you're gonna take C and so Y is actually gonna go on the left. We're so used to talking about variables as x predicts y, so we would do x equals y or x arrow to y. The way that R tends to interpret things is that we have to put y is approximated by these x's. So anytime you see a tilde, it usually means I'm approximating an answer. Okay. So this particular variable is approximated by these two other variables, okay. and that will make the arrows go from these to y. Okay, so it's a little backwards. In particular, the tilde in Levon implies that they're all squares. Okay. Um, and so we're gonna use that to uh, predict a square. So it actually implies that this thing is a square already in your model. And so one of the hardest things I think to get about Levon is when building these models, what goes here? And sometimes I just goof with it until I get the right one because there's several different forms of this. But um, page 28 is one of the like places where it has all of them written together to help you save that so that later when you can't remember, you can look at it again. Okay. But essentially, uh, the tilde here, the one we're gonna use during this section, is for predicting squares. Okay. So I have, um, a and B predicting C and I just this little um, pound symbol just means ignore this piece so I just was kind of making a note to myself now let's go back again I've got A and B predicting C now for D what I want to do is use C and A to predict D so I'm looking at all the arrows coming in so I've got C plus A equals D so that's where question four and question 12 reappeared again. So it added an extra path. It's not gonna get grumpy at you. You're not adding another square. You're just adding another line here, predicting D. Okay. Um, and so what I've done here is I've separated each one out into a separate line. That's also very important, is to keep each uh, tilde combination on its own line. So let me go back over here. And then, so what you're gonna do is first import that data set. I have it saved how I imported it. Um, but, oh, actually didn't like that so much. So let's click import data set from text file. Okay. And, oh, I renamed it. That was my problem. Um, what you wanna do is if you get this screen here, you wanna click on, hi, cute puppy. Hi, get down. Okay. Heading. Because here you see how it says variable one, variable two, variable three, we don't want that. So click heading, so that goes away. And then I'm gonna copy this. <clears throat> Ow, you're cute puppy, but go away. And one thing I don't wanna do um, is import this file starting with a number. So you see over here how it says one dot evals. That means it starts with a number, and R really is never very happy with you if you do that, so I'm gonna back up and just rename it to evals. Okay. Re-import that. So now I have one that's the exact same file that was evals. Okay. If you're having trouble importing files, go back, re-watch some of the videos about files and functions. 
Um, you can also use working directories if you're more familiar with that sort of thing. Um, it just depends on what you're most comfortable with. If you're fairly new, I tell you to import data set from text file, pick the file you're interested in, right. just rename it here. So I could call it evals here, make sure my header is turned on because I do have my first row as my header, click import, and then that will um, give me the code that I can copy down here and save for future reference. Always, always, this is something that I don't know is super clear, put how you imported the data set that you were using in your files. Because later, when you can't remember where the hell you hid that file, this will tell you and it will allow you to import it over and over again. Especially if you screw up part of the data screening and you're like, well crap, I have to start over. At least the import is at the top of your file. Okay, So just kind of a lessons learned the hard way. Okay. Alright, so I've got that imported. I'm going to load the Levon library. I'm also going to load Simplot. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, and you will want to install Simplot. Well, we'll get there in a minute. It is a big and grumpy uh, package. Let's just put it that way. So here I've specified the model. So I've said model equals. I've got my first quote. Your whole thing needs to be in quotes. I'm also going to and keep in, including this, but I didn't have to do this. So this um, um, pound symbol thing I didn't need, but I just did it so we could start to get used to the code. I'm going to run all of these lines together. And what you'll see is over here under values it pops up and it's got a bunch of funky stuff in it. If I type model down at the bottom, hit enter, you'll see that it has, sorry, these little slash ends in it. Okay, so what the heck is that? Okay. Um, the slash in thing just tells it that it's a new line. We'll come back to that in a second. Okay. So one thing that you should notice is that I didn't label the paths. So here in his picture from the book, he's got these paths labeled as Y, W, X, and Z. I don't have to label those. In the next example I'm going to do, I'll show you how you can label them, but that's really just for convenience purposes and for something we're going to do later. So we're going to come back to this idea, but it's actually not required. The other thing you'll notice is that I did not include these errors or the covariance error. Arrow. Okay. I didn't do anything with that. Um, and that's because it does those automatically for me, so I don't have to include them. <clears throat> so I don't have to label the paths and errors. Um, I, you can, if you want to force yourself to think about everything that's being calculated, but some of the models we're going to get to later, that would be exceedingly tedious, which is why I tell you not to do it. But you do have to label all the directional arrows and then any covariances like between errors, if you're interested in that. So page 28 is where um, everything is saved for this. And so we're going to go over each one of those explanations as we use them because it seems more sense to me to talk about um, when you use equals tilde and tilde tilde when you need it rather than everything at once and it seems really overwhelming. Okay, so be sure you have that sort of information saved. Okay. Now what is stored in that model? Okay. So the little slash in means it's a new line and so each um, declaration of like where your arrows are going needs to be on their own line. You can't run it all into one. Don't put any commas in or any semicolons. It doesn't like that. So each line, new line needs to be separated. And then anytime I use uh, the pound symbol, it's going to ignore those lines. And that'll just allow you to make some notes to yourself so you remember why you did what you did if you'd like. You can also do that. If I go back here, so you see how I have this here. You can also do it um, before and after the model. Okay, I've got my model built, now what? Unfortunately, that is not the magic. That's just the defining of what happens. So we're gonna use either the sim function or the CFA function to actually run the model. Okay. Sim and CFA both have just a gazillion different options, but the simplest way to run a model is to do sim, put in the model name, whatever you called it, we call it model, comma, data equals, and tell it where the data is. So let's do that. So I'm going to come over here. So I saved this. I called it path equals. You want to save it for um, reasons like down here. We're going to do something else with it. 
So save it as something. You can call it Swiss cheese if you'd like, whatever you want. I called it path because it's a path model. Equals sim, my model name. Data equals, and then evals, which is what I called it up here. If you called it something else, change this here to what you called it. Okay. So whatever your data is has to be over here. It won't run. Now, I ran that, and what happened? Uh, over here, under values, I got this new thing called path, and it's got a bunch of stuff in it. Do you see how fast that was? That's the glory of maximum likelihood and examples that I know work. Um, so what's happening is it's saving every piece of information that we could possibly want um, and waiting for us to do something with it. So now the cool thing is the default for Levon is normal theory, which is what we want, normal data, assume we've screened this data and it's normal, maximum likelihood as the default. Woohoo! You can change the type of estimator, the type of math, and you can use the help guide for the options. So what you do, if you want to see those options, is down here in the console window at the bottom, do question mark, sim, okay, oops, and mine got ahead of itself, stop, <sighs> question mark sim, maybe question mark CFA might work better, there we go. And it will give me some options so I can click on them. Okay. Oh, maybe question mark CFA won't be so complicated. All right, specify structural equation model. There we go. And so it allows me to see what the arguments should have been for that. Actually, let me go back. There we go. So here's CFA. So here are all the possible arguments for a CFA. Oh my God, that's a lot. We'll talk about parts of these one at a time. But then it explains them down here, and really the interesting one at the moment doo -doo -doo, is estimator. Estimator is how you can change the math function. ML is for maximum likelihood, GLS for generalized least squares, WLS for weighted least squares, ULS, DULS, oh my god, blah blah blah, tons of different things. So you can change it if you would like. I'm not, I'm gonna leave it alone. So, what's next? Now, I've built my model, I've run my model, let's look at the output. So we're going to use the summary function. The summary function is our fantastic function that does everything. So summary of the sim model. Okay. So I called it path. Don't do summary of the model. I don't even know what that would do. Let's see. Okay, it tells me that it's a character because model, remember, is saved up here and that's the structure of the model. We want to do a summary of the um, the run to thing, so the estimated piece. And what does that give me? Well, a bunch of stuff. So it tells me Levon converts normally after 19 iterations. So there's the the running part. Okay. Number of observations. So how many um, lines included all values that were used? So it will exclude missing data. Estimator with maximum likelihood. The minimum function test statistic is chi-square. Okay. Now, remember we said that max likelihood um, tries to maximize the likelihood of the, the data being from the population, which therefore minimizes the, the fit function. That's this thing, right? Because we want chi-square to be really small. Uh, I have one degree of freedom left. So we'll see if we can figure that out in a second. And it gave me a p-value for that. Okay. Right now, this doesn't mean a whole lot. When you watch the next video about fit indices, this will mean some more to you. Okay. Um, but let's stop and talk about degrees of freedom. Oh, no, Lias, let's make the picture and then talk about degrees of freedom. So hold on to that. Okay. What else did I get? It gave me my regressions. These are your paths here. Okay. And so I have question four is approximated by 12 and two here. So here are my two estimate, uh, estimates, <laughs> estimates. This is the non-standardized solution because I included non-standardized data. And so I have um, that the question two was a much better predictor of question four than 12 since they're all on the same scale, but they're both significant. 
And then here, question one. So this is um, question one is that last one of uh, the overall rating of the course. It's highly predicted by question four and a little bit by 12. So four, remember, is grading is fair. Um, and then 12 is this is a course I wanted to take. So they're all positive. Um, this is a course I wanted to take. It's not a very good predictor of fair grading, but um, clear organization of the course is a better predictor of fair grading, which makes sense. Okay. I also got my variances. Right? So for questions uh, one and four, these are those error variances. Okay. All right. So let me make a picture and we'll come back to degrees of freedom. What you get automatically is n, the estimator, the type of math, the minimum function test statistic, so chi-square, degrees of freedom, and p. Uh, you will also get those unstandardized parameter estimates, so those are your b coefficients, standard error, z, uh, and p, so you can tell whether or not those coefficients are significant. And then you will also get error variances. Important, so kind of like if you want to look at this, all of the cool stuff that we're going to talk about the rest of the semester is turned off. So the standardized estimates are turned off naturally. Fit measures, so all those fit statistics for the next class, uh, the next section, R squared, which is we squared multiple correlations, is also turned off, and modification indices. So we're going to go over all those in depth more later. We're going to use each one, uh, a lot of them together, but just kind of a natural thing of here's some examples of things that we're going to get to. Um, but all those are turned off automatically. So you kind of get the minimum output unless you tell it you need more. Um, so let's draw that picture and go back to degrees of freedom estimation. See if I messed it up. Okay. So what you're going to do is install Simplot. Simplot is a big package. It's going to take a bit. So um, to use it, I'm sorry, to install it, you want to click packages, install, start clicking sim plot, let sim plot run. I'm not going to reinstall it because it's grumpy. It will take you a couple minutes. Um, if your, oops, this button, um, R is a little bit older, you may have to update R for this to run. After you install it, be sure you load the library. I put that up here at the top. So sim plot. Then what we're going to do is I'll run simpads, which is a function in simplot to create our picture. Okay. So I'm going to do simpads, and that P is capitalized, just to be annoying. Um, path, so you pa plot the saved output, comma, what labels equal par, so that'll give me my parameter estimates. You could also do what labels equal STD, in quotes for standardized solution. Layout equals spring or tree. There's a couple of different options. So I think I have them here. So what labels can also be equal to STD? That's in quotes for a standardized solution. And that's what we're going to do more often than not. Layout can be tree, spring, circle, tree two, or circle two. And you can just kind of play with how all of them look. Uh, and I just picked the one that I could read the best when I made this picture. So let's go do that. So I've got simpaths here, path, what labels equals par, layout equals string, spring. Okay. And that creates me a picture over here that I'm working with. Okay. Or I could change this to, and they're really, it's really tiny. It gets to be <laughs> unfortunate to read. Um, but what you'll notice is uh, it isn't pretty, one, um, but it does do this uh, dotted line thing, right? So that's a covariance. Right? These two over here are variances right? because they have double-headed arrows and they've got the little dotted lines. Okay. We can change this to STD and that will give me the standardized estimates. Even though I haven't seen them in my output, I can put them on the graph. Um, and what will happen is you'll notice that this one here changed to 1. So on a standardized estimate, the variance is 1. You can also try some of the other options for a layout. Tree. Tree is fine, except these two um, labels overlap. So I could try tree two to see what happens. Uh, nothing changed. What were some of the other ones? 
circle to and circle. Okay. Ooh, no. Oops. Uh, make sure it's in the quotes. There you go. Ooh, no. So the reason I picked spring was because it was the most readable. Okay. Now back to degrees of freedom. Okay. All right, here we go. So let's calculate the number of available parameters. So what are the number of available things we could calculate? So remember that's the number of squares. One, two, three, four times four plus one. Four times five is 20 divided by two, 10, right? So I have 10 possible options. And then I said we calculated nine things. So that means that I have one degree of freedom left. So let's see, where do those nine go? Well, I had four paths. So we've got one, two, three, four, right? Um, I had one covariance arrow, that's five. Two errors, right? And the error terms are not dotted here. So these two errors here, and then two variances for our, um, I did not do that very well, but for our, um, two variances here for our in exogenous variables. And what we're left with is one degree of freedom. Okay. If I didn't want these to be co varied, if I didn't think, um, of course I wanted to take and fair and organize or, or clear and concise weren't correlated, I could make that zero and that would give us a degree of freedom back. However, we have an over identified model because we have at least one degree of freedom left but you can't do many more paths at this uh, point. Be well, you can't do any more because then you would have a just identified model. Remember, it's zero degrees of freedom, which is bad. So if you're having a hard time estimating these, creating this picture will really help because now I can just literally count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine numbers on my chart. Okay. I had 10 possible options and that is why, if I look at my summary one more time, there's one degree of freedom left. Some other things that you can just kind of do to play with is try turning on the different options. So I can turn on the standardized solution. We're gonna to get to all of these, but if you just wanna kind of like look at some of these extra things now, you can. Um, the standardized solution's got two extra options out here on the side um, that would make those all Z-scored for you. We can talk more about what do those mean each one. Um, you can try turning on fit indices. Okay. Oops, fit statistics, fit function, fit, what is it? Fit brains. Fit measures, sorry. Okay, and then I can look at all the fit statistics. So the most common ones are going to appear here above the um, above the estimates. And in looking at these, I can realize kind of quickly that something is wrong because these should never be negative, but that's in the next lecture. We'll talk about those some more. Um, we can also do R square equals true to look at the, um, actually look at how much of each variable is being accounted for. So that's actually pretty big, right? Um, we can also turn on mod indices. So mod indices will give us the ways that we might be able to change our model to make it better. So none of those are necessary right now when you're just learning, but if you wanna try turning them on and off and looking at how that changes the output, you can. Okay, so if you don't wanna see anything extra, ex exclude all that, they're naturally off. Okay, so all of that is the end of PATH. You have made your first Levon model, congrats. Um, if you'll go and you'll watch the second example for this, I'll work a couple of more models for you. And then um, if you're in my class, you should complete the uh, class assignment for today. And then the next section is going to go over fit indices and how to interpret if this model is any good or not.